everyone, and welcome to Talks at Google. I am simply beyond delighted to welcome back to Google our very own Anne Hyatt. Uh, many of you know her personally, and many more of you have heard of her by reputation. Um, but I think there's a great deal in her biography that uh, many of you probably don't yet know. Um, so just a quick introduction to many of her many achievements and accolades over the years. Uh, Anne was executive business partner to three titans of technology, Jeff Bezos, Marissa Meyer, and Eric Schmidt. Uh, she is now a leadership and growth strategist and founder and CEO of her own consulting firm. She has spoken at hundreds of large-scale events around the world. She has guest lectured at Harvard Business School, worked with executive teams at Netflix, Starbucks, Prudential, Lockheed Martin, just to name a few. She has recently authored this eye-opening book, Bet on Yourself, which is one of the most useful books that I've ever read. And it draws upon her decades of experience supporting these executives and foremost tech founders to draw a roadmap with which all of us can learn to recognize, own, and realize breakthrough opportunities in our own lives and careers. I had the personal privilege of working for Anne in Eric's office alongside our dear friend, Kim Cooper, in support of Eric, who is CEO and then chairman of Alphabet and Google. And when we asked Eric to describe Anne, he said, she is excellence without ego and a force multiplier for those around her. And I couldn't agree more. Anne, welcome back to Google. Brian, thanks for having me. Such I'm beyond treat. thrilled yes, <laughs> to be back with you. I can't believe this is happening. It's, it's been too long. <laughs> and you're lucky yes. it's on video, or else we might have conspired to, to keep you here <laughs> permanently. <laughs> so, so glad to have you back. Oh, it's a thrill. Thanks, Brian. And thanks for that generous introduction. And before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that we'll be taking a break later on in the chat for audience Q&A. So please feel free to add your questions at the right. Um, and among your many, many achievements over 12 years at Google, I think you actually had something to do with this very program at its beginning, <laughs> uh, the Talks at Google program. Yeah, this is a a thrilling full circle moment for me for many reasons. Um, but yes, I was on a team of just five people that back in the day was called Authors at Google, where we hosted incredible minds to come in and share their experiences and their expertise and knowledge with Googlers worldwide. It was founded by Josh Mendelson, and it was just a small strapping team of 20% volunteers when I joined, and the five of us were very much more makeshift than this beautiful operation is today that I never imagined back when I joined that team of just five people that it would become this incredible source of information and democratizing success for so many people. So I'm thrilled by the invitation. And you personally hosted several very high profile names, even when it was early scrappy days. Uh, who are some of your favorites? Yeah. My very first ever was Gloria Steinem. That was very intimidating. She and Jane Fonda came as part of the Women at Google talk series. And then I personally invited one of my heroes, Tina Fey, because she had a book at the time called Bossy Pants. So I hosted her. And then I had the great privilege of helping with the campaigns of the 2008. So we hosted Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, John McCain to all come and talk to Googlers about that very, very important 2008 election. And I, I think that was one of the greatest thrills of my life, honestly. So yeah, I've hosted all and you know Stephen Colbert, um, all, everyone in between. We really have met some incredible thinkers. Well, it's right and fitting that you're back <laughs> and in the guest oh. chair this time. So well, welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Um, before we, we launch into this incredibly interesting biography and, and the unique seats that you've occupied over the years, I want to rewind to the beginning, if we can, to kind of just get a handle on some of the early influences on the entrepreneur that we see before us today. Um, you, you didn't exactly come from a, a family that was deeply rooted in technology. Uh, quite the opposite. Yeah, both of my parents were children of potato farmers. And I'm literally the first generation non-farmer in the history of my family. So the fact that I've worked where I have is just like beyond improbable. But, but the big dreams, they started early because your father was dreaming much bigger than potatoes. 
True. When he was a young boy waking up before the crack of dawn to milk cows, his his big dream for himself was to become a pilot and not only a pilot, but a fighter pilot. And that is a dream that he made come true. And, and do I understand correctly that, that there's a certain movie starring Tom Cruise that, that's actually <laughs> partly based on your father's experience as a fighter jet pilot? Yeah, it might be overstating it a bit, but yes, when they were writing, when the screenwriters were writing the film that became Top Gun, they wanted to hear cockpit recordings so they would understand how pilots talk to each other, the lingo, you know, the vocabulary that is a fighter pilots. And they got permission to listen to my dad's squadron, the Hornets, and they adopted the flight names, the call signs of the pilots that they heard on those recordings. And my dad's call sign was Goose. And my whole childhood was uh, playing with the children of Maverick and Iceman and all these others who now have a claim to fame because of that movie. The real, the real life Goose. So, so he, he must have taken yeah. the entire family to go see the movie when it, when it came out. Funny enough, I didn't see it until I was in college because there were a couple things my dad did not like about the film originally. Um, first was that it they were called Navy pilots instead of Air Force because Air Force actually got nervous about the way the pilots were being portrayed. So they withdrew their permission to call them Air Force. The Navy had no such hesitations. So he didn't like it was Navy. He didn't like that they made Goose a navigator instead of the pilot. He was the pilot. And third, he didn't love that they killed him off. However, he did love that they made the character a good family man, which he is. But yeah, I didn't see it until college. Amazing, amazing. Well, I, I think you're you're probably walking in his footsteps with, with your big dreams and the way you've realized so, so, so much. Um, when you, you talk in the book um, about how the family moved from Florida to Alaska so that your father could mm -hmm. control the skies between Alaska and Russia. And mm -hmm. one of the most heartwarming images was your mom, she, she takes all of you children out to, to go berry picking in the wilds of Alaska. <laughs> yeah, my mom decided that if she was going to be dragged all across the world in this military life, she was going to create her own adventures. Not just my dad got to have his biggest dreams come true, but she was going to have her own. And so, yeah, she would take us out. We would go salmon fishing. We would go berry picking. But this is Alaska wilderness. We lived on base, but very quickly you were in the wilderness. And so she would tie little bells on our shoes so that we wouldn't startle any bears. They would definitely hear us coming. Okay. So that was the rough terrain and the incredibly rich like childhood experience that I had in that base in Anchorage. I, I feel like there's a metaphor there of tying bells to your <laughs> shoes and, and eventually walking the halls of giant tech <laughs> multinationals and not not surprising any bears <laughs> you walk around. I've never thought of that but I think you're probably right <laughs> <laughs> um but but your father didn't stay a jet pilot he, he he made a big sacrifice kind of early on and and what brought that on he did yeah he we were three daughters with the fourth on the way and my dad had missed every single Christmas of my childhood to that date he would go on flight for three months at a time. We, at the time, didn't know where he was because it was top secret, the missions that he was on. It was the height of the dilettante period of, of the Cold War. And so he was absent for a lot of my childhood. And there just came a point where he thought there was a different balance that he wanted to have for our family. And so he reinvented himself again. And he yeah, left the Air Force to his great heartache and uh, went to law school and has been a very, very successful lawyer after that. And, and he didn't just go to law school. He, he, he's having to provide for the family simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And so he, he takes on part-time janitorial work in order to pay the bills while he's in law school after yeah. having been a Top Gun pilot. It's true. It, I, when my father walked into a room in my childhood, everyone stood up and saluted. And to, it was a very drastic turn of events when he was you know, studying full-time, working as a part-time janitor, working to be on law review. It's um, a great example of humility and being willing to really make some sacrifices for, for big dreams, for, for the life, really purposely creating the life that you really want for yourself. We can put a pin in that. I, the idea of sacrifice as growth was really interesting to me throughout your book. And, and I think that mm -hmm. comes, will come up several times. So we, we can come back. But I'm going to zero in. You, you At this point, you're four kids, but it, the family's going to grow. And ultimately, yep. they'll be with how many of you? <laughs> seven. seven. Seven of kids. us. Yeah. And where are you in the birth order? I'm the oldest. The oldest. And, and did that play a role in, in who you became? Did it influence your personality? I think it really did. I am a natural peace 
keeper. I am kind of that Switzerland of the family. If any sibling has a problem with the other one, I'm usually the one uh, helping to resolve it. I also am naturally very organized and self-sufficient. I'm also very persuasive. I had to campaign to get people on my side if we wanted things done. So yeah, I think being the oldest and being a Libra, you know, I'm a balancer. I'm, I'm kind of keeping the peace, even when things were changing very, very constantly in, in our young family. Yeah, I think that influenced the way I approach the world and my work. In the book, we, we start to see really early indications of, of these personality traits and your work ethic generally. And I remember you mentioned that you, your, your mom set an alarm at, at 1 a.m. <laughs> when yeah. you were an, a student, I think in high school. And, uh, what, was, what was the purpose of that? <laughs> it's probably the opposite of what most parents are doing. So my mom would set an alarm for one o'clock in the morning, not to see if I'd snuck out with friends, but to make sure I had put the books away and actually gone to bed because I was a very serious kid and um, I set much higher standards for myself than my parents ever needed to. I have always just had that drive for the exceptional and um, yeah, hard work usually is how I dealt with that drive. What, what do you think was motivating that, that level of effort? That's a really good question. I think it's just one, it's kind of my part of my personality. It just is something I haven't been able to turn off. And have now in my adult life, learned to channel even more effectively. But um, yeah, it wasn't my parents' pressure or anything like that. But I think I saw hard work and big dreams modeled in both of their lives. They're both people who are passionate about the effect they have on the world and wanting to show up in a really meaningful way. And so I think it was just their example that that kind of led me to have that desire in the first place. And I kind of approached it in my own nerdy way as, as a high school kid. I, I was impressed in the book about how you, you talk kind of in the early years, there was maybe some insecurity that drove the effort, but later that very yeah. much evolved and, and you found much more constructive, positive reasons to, to exert the same level of effort. Was, was there kind of like an early influence in, in your schooling years that, that brought about that shift in, in mentality and perspective? Yeah, I was very paralyzed with this perfectionist paralysis that I think a lot of people experience, especially as teenagers. And I've had a series of teachers who really helped open my eyes to the fact that I don't have to worry so much about imposter syndrome and, and how normal these feelings are. But the first was probably Ron Mahan. He was my choir conductor in junior high. And um, I remember at the end of my eighth grade year, which I think for most people, but definitely for me, was particularly traumatic. It's just a weird time in life. And I asked him to sign my yearbook at the end of the school year. And he instead went to his desk drawer and pulled out a pre-written card that just encouraged me not to approach challenges with a fear or a preconceived idea of failure, but to really approach it with confidence in myself. And that even if it's not perfect, that iteratively, I am always progressing and getting better. So to be very, very proud of that process, not just waiting for perfection to be proud of myself, but being proud of myself for each iterative step along the way. And that was among many sliding door moments in my life that kind of woke me up to a new way of approaching my, my bigger goals and the way I wanted to show up in the world. So forever grateful to him. It's one of my favorite themes that comes out of the book is this reminder mm -hmm. that to not focus on the fear of learning, but to realize the positive outcomes that will come from it and to learn to, to convert that fear into excitement. And it, that's, that's easier scary. said than done. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah. And it needs constant reminding, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. But um, so let's fast forward out of out of school. And did, did you seek to become Jeff Bezos's executive business partner? <laughs> first thing out of college like was that was that the goal definitely not that was not a dream that had ever crossed my mind even though jeff was kind of a local celebrity seattle is kind of a small big town the economy is huge and its global influence is huge but it's actually very small um and jeff had been time magazine's person of the year in 1999 so i definitely knew who he was but no it was at the suggestion of uh, my my boss, um, when I was finishing undergrad, I studied at the University of Washington and graduated in 2002 with a bachelor's degree in international studies and a bachelor's degree in Swedish. Uh, my plan A had been to be a professor, but because the dot-com bust had just happened, the economy was really devastated and I had applied at quite literally like a hundred places and not got a single call for even like a phone interview. 
And he's the one who said, hey, have you ever thought of applying at Amazon? Because his wife worked in recruiting there. And that's literally the only reason I even threw my hat into the ring, never expecting what was going to happen next. So, so you're entering into the, the recruiting process at Amazon. And did, mm-hmm. did you even realize that Jeff was on the radar in any way? Oh, no. No one even, no one ever said that out loud until I sat down for my third round interview with him. I, it, it took me nine months to get this job. Um, but I had gone through two earlier review processes with um, all the admins in the company. I think there were about a dozen or so at the time. Then three months later, I got brought in for a second round with all the SVPs in the company. That should have been a clue that something big was going on behind the scenes. Because I remember thinking, this is a giant waste of their time. I am going, I'm surely the junior most person um, being considered to work at Amazon. But it was because I was being considered for a newly opened role in Jeff Bezos' office. So they were there to stress test me. And then, yeah, the last round was with Jeff Bezos himself. Wow. So, so he enters the room. And what do you think? <laughs> I honestly, I thought either he or I were in the wrong room because okay. <laughs> I, I just said it didn't, no one had told me in advance. The recruiter, when she brought me in for that third round, did not say it would be with Jeff Bezos himself. So yeah, I thought one of us was confused. Okay. So you recovered <laughs> from your surprise and, yeah. and you must have knocked it out of the park because he offers you the job on, on the spot. <laughs> he did. That's, that's the headline of it. But um he, he did have like 23 or so data points on me, like previous rounds of interviews. But it's true. He, people love to remember the fact that he only asked me two questions and hired me on the spot. Um, the first question was a brain teaser just to see how my brain worked, which was to estimate the number of panes of glass in the city of Seattle. And the second was really about passion alignment. He wanted to know how working at Amazon would fit into my larger career strategy. What did I want to learn there? What expertise did I want to develop? Why was this part of my journey? And at the end of that conversation, he did. He hired me on the spot and he showed me to my desk, which was physically closest to his in the entire company. You're you're three three feet away from from Jeff. Yeah, quite literally. And he actually built your desk. He did. I have a feeling this desk is going to be in a museum someday, (laughs) if it's not already. (laughs) Um, It was one of the famous three original door desks. Um, So when Jeff started Amazon in his garage in Bellevue, he was packing boxes and his knees were getting sore because he was leaning on his cold garage floor. He went to buy some desks or packing tables and um, thought they were ridiculously expensive for the purpose. But he saw at Home Depot that there were these doors on sale. So he decided to craft them through his own hands. And so I sat at one of those original door desks that Jeff made in his garage in Bellevue. Yeah, we're definitely gonna see that in the Smithsonian someday. (laughs) (laughs) I wish I'd carved my name into it back then. I should have. (laughs) Just to to circle back to to the earlier theme we mentioned about your father, Glade's sacrifice and abandoning a career as a fighter jet pilot to go to law school, taking on janitorial duties to to feed the Mm -hmm. family. Jeff Bezos himself incurred some pretty significant sacrifice when he founded Amazon. Is that right? That's right. Um, I think a lot of people don't think about this. Amazon now sounds so obvious and it's so all consuming and pervasive in our lives. People forget that at the time it sounded nuts. So Jeff had this very lucrative career. He was a hedge fund manager at DE Shaw. He was very successful. He was the junior most senior executive ever promoted to his level. He had the life. He had everything you would ever want to brag about. He had a very good paycheck. He had it made very early in in his career, but he had this crazy idea um, of this bookstore that he could start on the internet. And he even pitched it to his boss, David Shaw at the time, who famously passed. That was a billion dollar mistake. And he took a huge bet on himself. He he let go of all of that grandeur, his corner office and all this acclimate and, you know, easy pay, quote, quote, easy. He worked very hard for it, but this predictable paycheck and he risked it all to move to the other side of the country where he knew no one and started this company in his garage in Bellevue. Wow, wow. Very wow. similar, you're right. Yeah, maybe that's why I really jive with him easily because it was so similar to the behaviors that I'd seen in my parents, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love the consistency of that theme throughout. And yeah, if I can just re- read from your book just, just a little bit, you mentioned how sacrifice and growth are inseparably linked. Joy and opportunity diminish if you hang on to old laurels too long. Your kinetic energy is drained when you are stagnant. That, that really resonates. So you just, you might have something great in hand, but you have to let go of it in order to realize something better. There's actually a name for that. The, the monkey trap, is it? Oh yeah. So there's this great anecdote 
um, that I describe in the book where there were, scientists were trying to collect these monkeys who were actually extremely delicate. So the, the way that they would collect them to study them because they were um, going extinct is they would set out these coconuts chained to the ground with a little hole just big enough for the little monkey, this delicate little wrist to get in and they would grab a handful of rice but their fist was actually, once they had a handful of rice, too big to fit back out that same hole. And so they were effectively trapped because they were unwilling to let go of that handful of rice that they couldn't even enjoy anyway. And that's how the scientists collected them. And I think that's so analogous of so many moments in our life where we have something that we're so afraid to let go of, but in doing so, it's actually holding us back. I, I, I think it's a great, I, I honestly have to learn this lesson over and over again. It's not something you learn once and done, but that's something I reflect on often when I'm feeling that sense of like itching for more that I may be ready for a new challenge. I try and remind myself to let go of that rice so that I can have my freedom in exchange. Yeah, you exhibit that well. Um, so first job after college, you're just a few months in, you're seated next to <laughs> Jeff and, and you're very quickly put to the test in a way that most people can't imagine. Uh, can you, can you talk about what happened? Like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> the full story you will have to read in the book, but I, yeah, it was um, tasked, it was I think quite literally the first task that Jeff had come to my desk and specifically given just to me. But he uh, needed to go visit some properties in West Texas. I and nobody else knew what he was doing there uh, quite yet, but I hired my very first helicopter. Again, I'm 22 years old. Like, I don't have a helicopter in my Rolodex. I don't know how to do most of what's just been assigned to me. But off he goes on this trip. And um, the short version of the story is he crashed. That helicopter that I hired for him crashed with him inside. And um, that was more than just the risk of almost killing my boss, potentially of killing my boss. But also, we have to remember that in 2002, 2003, Amazon was not yet profitable. It was still in the red. And every single bit of shareholder value was based in faith in Jeff Bezos who I quite literally thought I had killed that day. It was a agonizing couple of hours until I found out what had happened. He did, he, he crashed in the helicopter I had hired. So, so during those hours, you're, you're having to assume the worst and yep. you call an emer emergency meeting of the board of directors. <laughs> you're working with the communications team for mm -hmm. every contingency. Mm -hmm. And did, did Jeff acknowledge kind of what went down and, and how you performed in that moment? It's probably one of the memories of my life that is permanently burned into my brain because, yeah, I had called this emergency board meeting. I was nobody. I'd only been at the company for a couple of months. The board directors didn't even know who I was. I, uh, it was actually the first day of work for our new communications officer. It was actually Andy Jassy's sister at the time, who's now CEO of, of Amazon. And uh, yeah, once I finally found Jeff uh, in the hospital where he had been taken and patched him into the board of directors, he asked to talk to me. And he said, he, in that phone call, he said what I think is the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me professionally, where he said, Anne, I hear you're really good under pressure. Now, he probably said more than that. I think I blacked out. I was just so relieved he was alive and he wasn't mad at me. But that was an important moment for two reasons. One, he no longer saw me as this junior 20-year-old who had no business having this job, which was probably accurate. But most importantly, it changed the way I also saw myself. And so from that moment forward, he gave me huge tasks that in no way resembled anything someone in my job description should be doing. And we really were an amazing partnership because I realized that even if something went wrong, A, it would never be as bad as a helicopter crash again. And B, I could trust myself to repeat that pattern of gathering the right experts around me, pulling together contingency plans, making educated recommendations, and keeping my cool and trusting myself that I was going to figure it out, even if I'd never faced a challenge like this before. And I think everything that's happened since in my career is a ripple effect of that moment. So while I pray that I never have another day like that again, I'm really glad it happened. And I'm glad it happened at the very beginning of my career, because it really changed everything that followed after. Yeah, I think you mentioned your mantra, be, be the calm in the storm. And from working with you, I know you exhibited that perfectly. There oh. could be huge amounts of chaos at, <laughs> at Google and Eric's office and that you were you were a rock <laughs> and we were oh. all for it. Oh. So so you're, you're at Google at, at the beginning and it's it's just after some time turning, starting to turn a, a corner from mm -hmm. losing money, 
to maybe being profitable. So Shirley, you, you must have stuck around to, to cash in your lottery. <laughs> this is one of the most frequent asked questions I get, especially when I'm t speaking at universities. They're like, why would you leave Amazon just as it's becoming profitable? So yeah, after three years, I left um, because I kind of went back to plan A and I wanted to be a professor. And I got into my dream program at Berkeley and I thought it was going to take a couple of years, but I actually got in on my on my first application. And Jeff was really proud. He was he knew that that had been my plan. We talked about it in that very first interview, and he was really supportive of anybody seeking out you know something bigger than themselves. So off I went. And <laughs> looking back, I mean, it's probably like a billion dollar mistake. But um, but yeah, I left after three years. I, I actually don't see it as a mistake. I think really important things happened after that. But um, yeah, but was it, was it a total nuts. goodbye to Amazon? Not really. So it's funny. I think the very last email I ever sent from my Amazon work email account was to Udi Mamber. Udi was a vice president who had been tasked with being the CEO of Amazon's search company called A9 based in Palo Alto. And that was just an hour from where I was moving to in Berkeley, California. And so I emailed Udi and it said, hey, I'm coming down. I'm going to be in your neighborhood if you ever need a Jeff Whisperer, which is what I became known for being, um, I'm around. And he emailed back immediately. And he said, when you're in California, come see me. And I ended up working for him every Friday, going forward and doing special projects for the CEO of A9. Are you even supposed to do that in graduate school? <laughs> no, I was literally like prohibited from taking in on, on any work while in my PhD study. So yeah, so I just, <laughs> I anticipated that I would miss it, that I would miss the pace of tech. And I just kind of wanted to keep my toe in the water, even though it didn't really make sense for my plan. And I had no idea how in doing so that would kind of set off another set of dominoes I had not expected. Uh, I've seen another theme start to take shape here, which is where you're taking on extra projects above <laughs> and beyond your core role in order to expand your identity and your opportunity. And, uh, and you put it really well, if I, if I may again, quote from the book, <laughs> probably <laughs> annotated. Um, oh, any, it's any, so, any, it's any, still so funny when someone quotes me back to me, but I kind of <laughs> love it. <laughs> I thought this was interesting because because literally you, the sentence starts, the secret to happiness, and it's on page one of the first chapter. So if you have the secret to happiness, you don't really need to read the rest of the book, but, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot else that's a, a, a good of wisdom here in the book too, but, so don't stop here. This is the secret to happiness is learning to find joy in the process of doing hard things. And I thought that that was fascinating. And it comes up time and time again that we hear about what's on your plate, supporting these executives. It sounds incredibly daunting and you're asking for more. And, and I was, you, so you must be digging deep and, and getting something out of it more than just sweat <laughs> and sleepless nights. I think that's the most important part of it is that it's an oversimplification, that sentence, but it, that, that's why the whole book follows that sentence, that opening sentence of chapter one, which is the joy in the process of, do, of doing hard things. And it's not waiting till that final finish line to feel satisfied or proud of yourself or like the effort is worth it. And I think um, that's something I'm really lucky that I saw exhibited from every level of people around me. It's the greatest gift that tech, the tech culture actually gave me was because I'm naturally very timid. I hate making mistakes. I hate this kind of messy middle part where you're figuring it out and kind of letting people whose opinions I really care about see my process. But because it was exhibited by every layer of person in the organizations, both at Amazon and at Google, it gave me that psychological safety to participate and kind of show up in the same way they did. So it was a little bit of my nature being nurtured into new behaviors. I'm not this big, bold, risk-taking, like follow me off a cliff kind of person. I'm much more iterative. And um, that's really what early tech taught me to be. And in fact, you mentioned at one point that you, you don't have a tattoo, but that if you did, <laughs> you know exactly what it would be. <laughs> can, can you share what, what that would be? Yeah. So this is something I stated in the conclusion um, where I say, yes, if I was to get a tattoo, I think it would say gratitum ferociter, which hopefully, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly, but Latin isn't a spoken language. It's just a written language, so I can say it however I want, I guess. But gratitum ferociter is actually the um, mission statement of Jeff Bezos's space tourism company, Blue Origin. That's not why I would get it. 
but it's because of the meaning. So gratitum ferociter means step by step ferociously. And I just think that's the perfect description of the way I now approach my life and career. I'm not this like big moonshot thinker. I love working for people like that, but that's not my personality. I love to be step-by-step methodical, but do so fearlessly and ferociously and showing up in a big way. And I think that's honestly made all the difference. Brilliant. So we've, we've gone off on a number of tangents, I'm, I'm sure. So, so we're running short on time. So I want to fast forward just a little bit to your, your you seem to be sort of circling Google here geographically. You're, uh-huh. you're <laughs> in Berkeley, you're taking on part-time work in Palo Alto. You're right on the cusp mm-hmm. of Mountain View. So, so Google must be coming to the fore at last. <laughs> they did. They did. That wasn't part of my grand plan. But yeah, as soon as I moved to California, people heard that I came down there because not many people worked directly for Jeff Bezos. So recruiters started calling and I was very happy in my PhD. I had thoroughly enjoyed my time at Amazon, but I didn't think that that was the next chapter of my career. But after a year or so, quite literally, of Google recruiters trying to talk me into it, uh, finally, a recruiter was very clever. Uh, Jeff was his name. And Jeff invited me to come to campus and just do a tour. He said, don't you want to see what it looks like? You know, I'd heard about the free food and you can bring your dogs to work and all those famous perks of early Google. And the second I stepped foot on campus, I knew that this was my tribe of people and that this was going to be my future. I did not expect that it would be for the next 12 years, but I knew I'd kind of found a natural home. Who were, when, you, when you went on that tour and you, and you sat down for lunch, who, who were you seated between? Very memorably, it was between, I don't know if this is by accident or by very clever design by Jeff, my recruiter, but I literally had lunch between a former astronaut who had been to space, um, a former professional cyclist who had um, done the Tour de France with Lance Armstrong in the height of his fame, early fame. <laughs> um, let's see. And at Vint Cerf, the original architect of the internet. That is who happened to be at my lunch table. Wow. I, <laughs> and, I, and I have to, again, it, those of us who, who work at Google now, it, it, it often, it's good to remember these early days and just <laughs> these early first impressions of Google. And you say that the employees were unconventional and irreverent in their personal and thinking style. They were data-driven in their decision-making and goal-setting. The unapologetic pace, the audacious goals of the company, being a major player in inventing the future of technology. It was all intoxicating. Yeah. So you you felt like you had found your home. I loved every single bit of it, honestly. It was just people who were unapologetically dreaming and making a lot of stakes, mistakes along the way. There's something really special about that combination of insatiable curiosity, incredible drive, passion-driven work, and just being surrounded by like the smartest people in the world. It was really, really... Yeah, intoxicating, like I said. And, and you mentioned passion-driven work. Um, you talk about, in the book, the mentalities of work, and there are different ways that you can approach what you do. Can, mm. can you elaborate on, on what those different types are and, and where you fit? <laughs> we could talk about this for hours. This is <laughs> among my favorite things to, you know, you, you mentioned that I do a lot of consulting with high performing organizations and leadership teams. And this is really what we talk about is I think that the greatest framework, it wasn't purposeful this way when I was doing it or, or in my early career, but now looking back, there were some patterns of behavior that I think helped me create my own luck, engineer my own serendipity. And there's a structure now that I can see quite clearly in retrospect that wasn't quite clear in the moment that I now call the win, win, win. And this is something I encourage everyone, regardless of your seniority or industry, to really do this thought process, because for me, it's been life changing. The first part of the win is asking yourself, what do I want out of this next next stage of my career? What are the expertise I want to develop? What's the skill set that I want to be known for? What's the reputation or network that I'm building? And then have a conversation with the stakeholders in your life, your manager, even your life partner, people who really need to be invested and get on the same page with this plan. That's the second win. When I am as an individual contributor and my ambitions can solve a problem for my manager, um, that allows her or him to delegate more freely to me because that will free them up to contribute to the third win, which is how the organization needs that manager to be showing up. So when I'm purposeful in what I want to learn, 
allowing them to delegate something to me so they can show up in a bigger and more meaningful way towards what the organization needs for us to win as a whole. That's actually how you get a yes to seemingly crazy ideas. I have proposed things that are far outside my job description that are far, far senior to my expertise. But when I frame it within the win, 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 that's when I get at least a trial. Often if I get a first no, I say, what do you think if we do an experiment within the next month or so? Let's try X behavior. Here's the success indicators we should look for. If we see this, this, and this happening, maybe that's something we can continue. And um, that's a very data head way of presenting it, but it's worked every time, honestly. Yeah, I, I love that. And I thought it was particularly interesting. And it, personally, I find it a challenge to get beyond uh, the nitty gritty of my job. Mm. It's a, you know, a long mm -hmm. past list of yep. seemingly minor, small things that is just... And there's so much there that it's hard to really turn my attention and focus on the big stuff. And, and I thought it was interesting how you said that by, by framing it, by aligning your goals personally as an individual contributor with the goals of your team and your company, you, you create for yourself mental permission to focus mm. on the big things. Yeah. In the book, I share an analogy about rocks, pebbles, and sand that was popular, popularized in the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And um, to your point about like the never ending to-do list. So once we have this win, win, win conversation, that's not the end of the story. There's always more that we could, could be doing, need to be doing, and we need to sort through and prioritize, especially in tech, constantly rotating that priority list. So Rops, Pebbles and Sand is a nice analogy where it says your time is like a glass jar and you have to put in these Rops, Pebbles and Sand, but the order of operations is really important. It's really important to identify first for yourself, confirm with your manager and for the needs of the organization, what the rocks are. If I can only do three things today, what should those be? Because if you put the rocks in the glass jar first, then the pebbles will fill in the extra spaces and the sand, if applied last, will fill in all those crevices. However, I found, and especially um, now that we're working remotely from each other, it's really tempting to touch a lot of sand every day because you're like, look, manager, look how many times my name's in your inbox, email, 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 email. But that might not actually be what they need from you most. It might be heads down, serious, thoughtful work, and you're, you're working on one rock today, which when you're remote can feel really like, do they know how hard I'm working? You feel a little bit invisible. But if you have this really proactive conversation with them of seeing like, I think this is the way I can contribute most to our success, then that's a great way to be promoted. That's a great way to be seen as a true problem solver. Um, but it's a conversation that needs to happen often. And you talk specifically in the book about how to be recognized for your contributions and how to set yourself up for promotion. Mm -hmm. And and it sounds like you learned the hard way. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In your experience. Yeah. You talk about like, did. how you did it the first time and how that went and then how you oh actually ultimately learned to do it. Yeah, the first time I asked for a raise was about a year after I started at Amazon. To be fair, uh, it was a very low salary because it was my first job out of school. I was definitely being underpaid. So it wasn't ridiculous that I was looking for an increase. I'd performed very, very well and far outside of the um, job description I'd originally been hired for. There was a case to be made. However, I did not make it. I just Basically, I had been um, through no proactiveness of my own, been recruited by Microsoft and they were trying to steal me away. So I just came to Jeff and I was like, look, I have no interest in working at Microsoft, but I have this competing offer. They want to give me X number more dollars. Will you match that? And I'd love to stay. That's the case I made. That was not well received to say the least. Jeff was not impressed with that. And while it wasn't wrong, it wasn't compelling. I didn't actually make the case of like, here's what you hired me to do. I'm doing actually this, which is this job description, which competitively in the market is this. And here's how that has freed you up to do X, Y, and Z. I just didn't make the case. Lesson learned. I never did that again. It was truly, I mean, he could, it was one of the times when he was so angry, he just didn't engage. He was just like, fine. He just, <laughs> and, and that's kind of the horror. I mean, I'd much rather Jeff yell at me than give me that kind of like, nonplussed. So it never happened again. But then when I was at Google, I thought, okay, I'm going to apply. I'm going to do this very, very differently. And I decided since Google is a very data-driven company, I had a spreadsheet that I used. In fact, this is how I got you hired onto my team. This is how I make a case when I need something. Is I, um, I first went when Eric became executive chairman, we had to completely reinvent the way he showed up for the organization, for the tech community, for our users at large, which is basically the entire world. 
And so I needed to really reinvent myself and create a role that had never existed at Google before, which became chief of staff. Um, in doing so, I really had to make a case to Eric about what that should look like, how many people needed to be on our team, what expertise we needed to be developing, how we were going to show up in a completely new and unexpected way. And so when I was trying to expand our team, because we were absolutely drowning, just Kim and I, <laughs> um, I did it through a spreadsheet where I said, here's what we're contributing right now. Here's what the organization needs from us, which is much more than what fits in column A. Here's column B, which we're doing by working 15 hour days and we cannot do this forever. And then there was a third column. These are the shiny objects that I knew Eric would want. And I said, if we had a third person on this team, here's all the game changing 10 Xing opportunities that we could do that I think is actually directly tied. Again, this is the win, 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 directly tied to how Google and our users globally need you to show up. He said, yes. At first it was a trial and then I got to hire you full time. But um, I think that format is really, really compelling. Love it. I'm glad to be one of the wins. <laughs> <laughs> you you I, are definitely one of the biggest wins ever. <laughs> I could um, go on reading about the book and, and talking through your life story for, for hours. Um, I'd like to take a break and, and uh, let the audience uh, join us. We, we have a live question uh, from Mallory Rothstein, uh, one of our own Googlers who, in addition to being an executive business partner, is the founder of Beyond an Admin, uh, mm -hmm. a, a group that's dedicated to expanding the, the identity of, of the admin role at Google. Uh, so welcome, Mallory. Hi, Anne. Thanks so much for joining us today. My question is, what has been the greatest blessing and the greatest challenge for you since transitioning from being an executive business partner and chief of staff to a leadership strategist? There's so many layers to that question, Mallory. I think it's a really smart one. Um, it's been hard. You know, I find that I've made a lot of mistakes, but I had to remind myself that that's part of success. And um, honestly, what I miss most is my team, like Brian especially included. But I think um, I had to kind of go back to my original methodology for reinventing myself and ask myself those hard questions. Like, look, I left Google in September of 2018 moved to the other side of the planet. I'm actually based in Europe normally, based in Spain. And I was really invent inventing myself from the ground up again. And I went back to that original conversation of what expertise do I want to be known for? What are the tribe of people I need around me in order to be successful? Really gathering those experts. And I thought there were three things that I needed to be successful, which I think in general are true, especially when we're leveling up in our careers. The first category is a mentor. Somebody who knows my work, sees me kind of on a regular basis and is able to give me that iterative feedback. The second is a sponsor. A sponsor is somebody just a step or two ahead of you who can open the doors that you can't yet open for yourself. And it's really important that that person's only a step or two in advance. The biggest mistake I see is people going and looking for a sponsor that's like 10 years ahead of you. And that doesn't really work because one, a lot of times they don't remember how they got through that door in the first place or the contacts or context in which they got there themselves is no longer relevant. Um, so really look for somebody who's just a step or two ahead of you. And then third is actually my favorite category, which is an avatar mentor. And it's my favorite because these people don't need to know you exist. These are the people who are 10 years plus ahead of where you want to be. They're on the stages you want to be on, writing the books you want to write, leading the teams or working on the problems that you want to be leading. And Thanks to the internet, we can kind of reverse engineer how they got there. I can kind of follow their path of how step-by-step step, iteratively they qualified themselves to sit at those tables, stand on that stage, et cetera. And so a couple of mine are um, Adam Grant or um, Brene Brown or Sarah Blakely. These are leaders that are self-made. They did everything kind of the wrong way. They did, did it the non-traditional way. And I find that wildly inspiring. So those three categories and being really purposeful in, in creating this tribe, the support system around me that keeps me really accountable to my big goals, I think has been really, really helpful and helps me in those moments of terror. Um, there's this great book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Mm -hmm. And um, my favorite line in that book is, as an entrepreneur, there are only two emotions, terror and euphoria. <laughs> which is so true because every day I swing wildly between the two. Um, but I think it really helps me in those moments of self-doubt um, to remember that that's just what success feels like. So that's how I've tried to take those principles, those building blocks um, that I learned in being a, an assistant and EBP and a, a chief of staff into now founding my own organization. But I've made a lot of mistakes and that's just part of the process. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. 
Thank, Thank you. Robert. I think we have time for just one more question from the audience. Uh, Stephen Wengrovitz asks, what advice do you have for aspiring authors like you? Can you tell us about mm. your mindset, goals, process of translating all your hands-on experience into a book? Stephen, we should take this as like a separate full hour discussion. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it was super hard. So I'd never written a book before. I thought it would be more like, you know, projects I've worked on, really complex projects I've worked on. I'd written articles. I thought that that formula would translate into my creative process. It did not. So the first thing, my first advice to anyone aspiring to be an author is give yourself some grace to figure out your creative process. Unfortunately, this is something that you probably cannot learn or adopt from anyone else because it's so specific to the way that you're individually creative. And I actually hearken back to some of my experiences at Amazon and Google to learn my creative process. So when I was at Amazon, Jeff Bezos um, did a quarterly thinking retreats where he would take himself outside of his conference room and just clear his mind of all the clutter and um, free himself up as much as possible. And he came back with notebooks full of new ideas. So for him, it really took a couple days of getting out of his routines in order to let inspiration come to the forefront. Then when I, you know, when we, Brian and I were working uh, for Eric, he did in a totally different way. He did that through, um, you know, whenever he was in a new city, he would gather a table full of the smartest people in the world who had expertise different from his. And that would that would invite his brain to spark new ideas and make new connections. He never would have otherwise if he was just in his usual circles where he was the smartest person at the table. Um, Bill Gates famously goes to his boathouse with bags full of books and pulls inspiration from that. So everyone has their own creative process. For me, after through a lot of trial and error, I realized I needed four hour chunks of time. If I gave myself an entire day, I didn't get anything done. If it was two hours, I was still in the mindset of what I'd just done or being worried about what was coming next. So it was really a sweet spot of about four hour chunks when I could be creative. Honestly, the hardest part of writing this book was being taking 15 years of experience from some of the greatest minds and most amazing moments in tech history and getting it down into a single draft. There's 70% um, of the original book that I wrote that is on the cutting room floor. So stay tuned for books two and three. But um, yeah, that was really, <laughs> that was really the hardest part. But I think my biggest advice to aspiring authors is to really spend some time figuring out your creative process structure, what time of day, what number of hours, et cetera, what inspires you. I literally have this candle on my desk of a scent called magic wood that I would have to light every time I wrote because that smell got me into the creative zone. So yeah, discovering what works for you. But to be continued, I think that's a really good question. And I, I watch my uh, website. I'm going to post something on that and give you a couple more tips beyond that. But that's where I would start. And thank you so much. We're much to my dismay at time, <laughs> but I couldn't be more grateful for you taking the time to join us again and to share so much wisdom in this book. Uh, just a reminder to everyone to run out. There's also a link in the YouTube description if you'd like to buy it. And um, yeah, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. And uh, we'll see you at the next Toxic Google event. Thank you.